Hello my makeup loving friends, how's it going? Welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, hi my name is Teresa, I do things sometimes. Today I am actually doing a makeup and murder. Now I know I haven't done this in quite some time but I'm giving it a go again. Um, and actually my friend Charlie, I'm gonna link her channel down below, she's planning on doing something along these lines on her channel as well. Obviously um, the origin of a lot of these sort of series is from Bailey Sarian. I didn't necessarily get the idea from her, I've kind of been doing that on my channel for a while, but obviously I will link her down below as well because she's really cool, like much cooler than me. So maybe don't watch her because then you won't come back to me. Yeah. Anyways, today we are talking about uh, Luis Garavito and he is potentially one of the most prolific serial killers of all time, which is odd because I'm sure you may not have actually heard of who this particular person is. I know I hadn't until my lovely friend Victoria actually suggested that I research him for this series. So a huge, huge thank you to Victoria for suggesting this. It has been fascinating, if not a little bit terrifying. So if you want to sit and listen to me talking about Luis Garavito and some of the psychological factors around his murders while I do this to my face, then this is the video for you. Do please keep on watching. So when we're talking about Luis Garavito, we might as well start from the beginning in the same way that we'd start with our eyes first. I'm not going to tell you what it is that I'm doing because this is more of a, a chatty thing. So, Luis Garavito was born on the 25th of January, 1957, in Genova, Colombia. He was born into, well, I won't say abject poverty, but it wasn't in the best of circumstances. Colombia has had a lot of issues over the last number of decades in terms of abject poverty and extreme violence. So this kind of makes the perfect backdrop for a serial killer. So, uh, Luis Garavito was born to a father who was extremely abusive and he was an alcoholic. His mother was uh, addicted to drugs but she was also operating as um, a prostitute. I mean we've talked about various serial killers before and how a lot of their experiences growing up could potentially formulate their responses later on. Garavito witnessed his mother's working life uh, from an exceptionally young age. He was brutalized by his father. His father often made him actually watch um, his mother's customers engage with her and at times those particular customers would actually abuse him as well. So he was exposed to a huge amount of brutality at an exceptionally young age. Now, we know from um, developmental psychology that the experiences that we are exposed to very early on do form our basis of personality, things like our self-esteem. So to say that this didn't have an impact on him is just to be foolish. But in saying that, there are plenty of people who go through such experiences, well not plenty, but there are people who go through these experiences and don't go on to be one of the world's most prolific serial killers. He experienced all of this, some extreme, extreme um, abuse, and it's estimated that he was exposed to this from about the ages of three onwards. So it was a very young life to be exposed to all of this. At the age of seven, it was so bad that he eventually actually ran away from home and began to live on the streets. And it was about a year later that he ran into a particular man. And this particular man said that he would help him, he would get him food, he would get him shelter. And on that basis, he managed to lure Luis Garavito to a particular area and this house was actually being used for human trafficking of children. So when he was brought there he was completely brutalized and um, incredibly badly assaulted. So 
we can see, again, he was just having a lot of experiences of this. So this was at the age of eight he uh, experienced this. Now, as is often the case, um, there were no files or any sort of um, criminal actions taken against the man who brutalised uh, Luis Garavito. He actually got away with it. Um, so Luis continued to live on the streets. He then got involved with a gang and they engaged in a lot of criminal activity because one of the issues with Colombia is obviously around poverty, but the biggest issue is actually around child poverty. Um, a lot of kids end up living on the street. So it's, it's quite serious. So he Kind of operated with this gang partly out of just sheer survival and well let's be real if you're living in those circumstances is you you kind of do what you have to 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 attempt to survive so he stayed with them for a period of time however he did eventually try to go on the straight and narrow um he actually became a street vendor um, so in Colombia you have street vendors and they'll sell anything from uh, things like lottery tickets to cigarettes to religious paraphernalia. So he did that for a period of time. He actually even managed to settle down for, for a period of time and he had a girlfriend called Teresa. <laughs> Not me, somebody else, who also, by the way, had a child by somebody else. And she maintained that he and this particular child had a really great relationship. Um, she just didn't get to see him much because he was a quote unquote bit of a traveler, which isn't a euphemism for anything. Um, <laughs> he just tended to be gone for long periods of time. Now, in the backdrop, um, I, see, I'm not going to go into each of the murders because that would just, that would take too long. It is estimated, but there are 138 confirmed kills, but it is estimated that he has 300 kills. So I literally, I, I couldn't sit here and talk about all of them. And I know that's terrible because the victims should be remembered rather than the killer themselves. But that is just the nature of today's video. So, by this point, it's pretty clear that Luis Garavito has gone through an awful lot in his life. And actually, he seemed to be showing some signs of PTSD. So that's post-traumatic stress disorder. And that wouldn't be uncommon. There have been studies that have found that children who are exposed to that level of abuse, or at least similar levels of abuse in their childhood, experience a certain amount of PTSD. Of course, PTSD comes in varying levels of severity. And when we see people who have PTSD, they often um, struggle with emotional disturbances and some turn to alcohol misuse as a way of coping. And this was certainly the case for Luis. And he was documented to ha have started drinking an awful lot within his 20s. Now, his friends maintained that he was actually a very kind and caring person. However, he was very quick to anger. So this is quite important for us to understand. Given the fact that the majority of the abuse that um, Luis Garavito was exposed to was between the ages of six and 16, it'll come probably as very little surprise that the majority of his victims were actually young boys between the ages of six and 16. Now, some psychologists may say that this is him potentially reliving his trauma, taking the um, perspective or role of the abuser rather than the abusee so that he has control over the situation. Of course, that again is no excuse for the crimes that he committed. There are people who go through these traumas and don't do these things, but it is important to kind of understand that this may have actually influenced the type of victim that he was. So it's not entirely clear as to when exactly he started his horrible murder spree because of the sheer number that's involved and not all bodies have actually been recovered. But um, we know that he employed certain methods to gain his victims. Now, if you have watched my previous um, video about Albert Fish, who was a horrific serial killer as well, he employed similar 
tactics in that he tried to make sure that he was going for people who were not likely to be missed. So he was going for kids who were working on the streets as uh, street vendors, etc. So who were likely to be children of poverty who may not have parents themselves. And at this time, uh, Colombia was, of course, going through an awful lot of turmoil in terms of um, gang warfare. And there were actually other serial killers in operation at the time. Now, Luis Garavito, due to the brutality of his killings, actually became known as La Bestia. Now, forgive me, because my... Colombian, I believe, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know the language, is not great, so I, I try my best. So he was known as the Beast. So he terrorised in the 90s, uh, like I said, 138 victims. So he would take these particular kids, offer them jobs, sweets, um, shelter, etc. And he would walk them quite a distance away to attempt to tire them out. So he would take them away from the village where they were living in. Now, I'm afraid this is the part of the video where I get a little bit into the details of the murders themselves, but I don't want to go into too much detail because it is just horrendous what he did. So he would, like I said, have these kids walk essentially to their deaths. And once he got them far enough away and they were sufficiently tired, he would tie them to a tree and begin to brutalize them. Now, a lot of the children were found with their heads removed. So these were brutal, brutal uh, murders. And there were uh, signs of very clear assault. Now, at a lot of these uh, locations, he actually left beer bottles with things like fingerprints and clear uh, DNA. Now, this wasn't the case for all of them because obviously Colombia is very warm and the more that you leave things out in the sunlight, the more it is that DNA, etc., degrades. So they were actually able to recover a certain amount of DNA from these particular sites. But he was, a lot of the time, drinking. Again, this doesn't actually excuse anything at all. But he... <laughs> would insert things into the children. Again, I don't want to go too graphic because I just, I don't think this is appropriate, but he would also remove parts of the child and have them put it into their own mouths. So this wasn't just a killing, this was incredibly, incredibly sadistic. Um, and this is something that we kind of have to remember as we are going along on this. Now, in 1996, uh, a child went missing. This was not unusual at the time. A lot of kids, unfortunately, went missing in Colombia. And um, unfortunately, they are horribly under-resourced. They just don't have the means to look for a lot of these kids um, when this essentially goes down. So the mother of this particular child, knowing that this was the case, went and tried to sort this out herself. And in questioning this child's friends, he was found five days later. Unfortunately, he had himself uh, been murdered. In questioning the child's friends, she found that a man uh, in his 40s had taken her son along with his friends to a particular sweet shop and the man fitted the description of Luis Garavito. So at this point the police actually brought him in and questioned him but there wasn't really any evidence on him and he was let go and it was then four days later that he then murdered a further victim. So there was very little time between his actual kills. There would have been a cooling off period of a of about two weeks. Now this is quite prolific for a lot of killers. They will go between maybe a year, two years in terms of their kills. So it shows he didn't really have a lot of uh, impulse control when it came to these particular things. Now there was a police officer who was in charge of the case uh, by the name of Duran, D-U-R-A-N, so like Duran Duran. And he actually became known as the shadow of the killer because he became so 
um, absorbed by the case and he was really investigating it from as many angles as possible. So they were at the point where there was a lot of killings going on not just from Louise but from other serial killers at the time so they were trying to figure out the behavioural profile. Unfortunately again like I said they just didn't have the resources. Nobody was pumping in money um, in Colombia to find these missing kids but there was this one particular investigator and he spent a lot of time uh, devoting essentially his efforts towards that particular investigation. He became aware of these particular allegations against Luis Garavito so he started to be on his radar. Now like I said uh, Garavito uh, tended to be um, intoxicated at the scene of an awful lot of his crimes. So the thing was, because Luis Garavito was drinking, he was actually quite sloppy in terms of the murder scene. So he would actually leave behind things. So like I said, he left behind beer bottles with things like fingerprints and DNA evidence. But he also left behind things like um, underwear, and at one point even left behind a pair of glasses. Now this was really incredibly helpful in terms of his later capture. Now in 1999, in April of 1999, um, Luis went uh, towards attempting to capture another young boy. However, his efforts were actually thwarted by a homeless man. And it was again this particular instance that alerted the police to some of the behaviour around uh, Luis Garavito and they do believe that if he, if this particular homeless man hadn't actually intervened it is pretty likely that he would have actually killed this particular young boy. So it was at this point that Luis was actually uh, brought in for questioning and he of course acted dumb, um, said that he had no idea what it was that was going on and these murders were terrible terrible things and that he was incredibly upset by all of it and um, in the meantime before all of this his previous girlfriend, Teresa, it's unclear as to whether they were still together. She said she didn't see him much because he engaged in a lot of traveling, which, okay. Um, but she let the police officers have access to the house and it was there that they found some very disturbing evidence. So within the house, they found pictures of a lot of young boys um, in compromising situations and they had a journal, they found a journal which indicated details of the kills. So they, he essentially kept a tally. So this is not unusual for serial killers to keep some form of token or trophy of their kills. And this was Luis Garavito's. Now, as I said, um, he actually had left his glasses at one of the crime scenes and this ended up being a little bit of a smoking gun because he had a very rare prescription like me and it turned out that some of the issues he had with his eyes were only to um would only occur within a certain age of population so they they went to an ophthalmologist and the ophthalmologist said well actually based upon his prescription um the particular person who is committing these crimes has to be uh between 45 and 60. So this narrowed down the pool of investigation quite considerably. So by the time they actually had Luis Garavito in their clutches, they kind of had a decent idea of what was going on, but they needed to get further evidence. So they actually started to detail evidence of the crimes and exactly what it was that had been done to these particular children. And they went into quite an amount of detail with this. And it was when they were going into this detail that Luis actually began to break down and he eventually admitted to these particular crimes. In the meantime, when he was in prison, they actually tested all of the prisoners to uh, determine their eyesight. And the reason why they did this was actually to see um, whether the prescription of the glasses found at one of the murder sites matched Luis Garavito. Now, of course, you know, if you know that somebody is looking for your particular prescription, you could potentially falsify your results on um, an optician's test. So they were actually very clever about it. 
And they had all of the prisoners um, where Luis Garavito was staying uh, tested. That way it wasn't clear that he himself was being singled out. It was just indicated that this was something that was being made available to all the prisoners. And this was another piece of evidence that they were able to use against him. So eventually he admitted to these particular crimes. Like I said, there are 138 um, confirmed kills. However, based upon his journal entries, it is estimated that there are 300. But let me get to what is, I believe, the most chilling part of all of this. So at this point, the evidence against Garavito was quite frankly, pretty, pretty strong. And he pleaded guilty, which weirdly helped him. Now, this is what I think is the creepiest part of all of this. Colombia has very specific laws. And despite the fact that he murdered a minimum of 138 people, the maximum sentence that could actually be handed down to him was 40 years. So he was put into prison for 40 years for all of that. But it gets worse. Because he admitted to his guilt and he um, was apparently a role model um, prisoner, engaging in lots of courses, etc. This was put down to 22 years. So that's right. He was put into prison in 1999. He has now served almost 22 years. So Luis Garavito is due to be released very, very soon. Now, as a psychologist looking at this particular case, I can only say that somebody with that case of uh, antisocial personality disorder, now he did try to claim that there were voices, etc. That was not the case. He had an antisocial personality disorder, which a lot of people outside of the realm of psychology refer to as psychopaths. That means there's going to be a high rate of recidivism. Somebody like that cannot be rehabilitated. We also know that people who engage in paedophilia are also very likely to reoffend. Yes, he is coming out in his 60s and 70s, but he is a danger. So for me, the scariest part of all of this is he is coming out soon and he is likely to re-offend. And due to Colombian law, there's not much that can be done about it. So my friends, that's it. That is the end of the story of Luis Garavito, or is it actually the beginning? Who, who really knows? Um, major thanks to Victoria who suggested this as a topic. I know I haven't done this in a while. Take some getting used to, getting back into the swing of things. Let me know down below if there are any other topics or people that you would like me to include on this. I want to do this about every five to six weeks because it does take a bit of time to research. But that is it. That is the end of the video. Do please like, comment and subscribe. Do please share because sharing is caring unless of course it's an STD in which case, you know, wrap it up. Don't be gross. But that's it. That's the end of the video and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.